All right, hey everybody. So this is a 12:30 session at XCommerce Innovate. Today we're going to be talking about mobile shopping trends and technologies. My name is Martin Herbst. And this is PJ Lenarducci with PayPal Mobile. So before we dive into the content, let's ask a few questions from the audience. Um, one's a very basic question: Who here owns a smartphone? Actually, who, own, who doesn't own a smartphone? It's basically about everybody. So who here, of those people who have, have a smartphone or, or, not a, or not a smartphone, has actually made a purchase on that phone? So maybe 50%, two thirds. Okay, who here has helped develop or developed a mobile solution or app? Okay, that's a good number. So we're probably about 30, 40%. So, this is good, because we're going to cover a lot in the next 30 minutes or so, but we have a little bit for everybody. So we're going to start off with what's happening now, where are some of the trends that we're seeing, where are some of the user behaviors that we're seeing from both surveys and, and um, some trends and technologies that are out there. Basically, what you must do if you are considering building a mobile web solution. And then we're going to talk about some of the newer things, some of the newer solutions and technologies that are out there. So if you've already built a mobile solution or have an app, what are some of the things you want to consider adding to that or how do, you, how do you change that? And then last, PJ is going to get into some of the um, sort of what are the next technologies that are coming out or that can be leveraged to tickle the imagination. So beginning with a little bit more of the basics and, and things that are going on at the moment, what is driving e-commerce? Well, first and foremost, you, almost everyone raised their hand, everyone's got a smartphone. So what a smartphone is, essentially, it's a portable computer in a much more elegant form factor. And we've seen over the last year or so that the sales for smartphones have really begun to surge. Particularly in the end of 2010, a couple factors went into this. It was the iPhone 3GS launch, broader Android availability. Of course, you've got your holiday sales that always pushes sales. And it hasn't stopped since. And with this adoption of smartphones, again, being able to take that e-commerce experience portable anywhere you go, having the robustness of that e-commerce experience at your disposal at any time, what's happening is that we're seeing, this is a, a slide or, or a chart that Mary Meeker popularized about a year ago, is that the trend that we're seeing is that as a, as a percentage of retail sales, m-commerce is growing three times faster than e-commerce did. So again, the trajectory, the demand is huge and it's happening now. So what's driving, what are the behaviors, what are those latent demands that are driving mobile shopping? What's driving you, what's driving me to actually make these purchases through my phone? You see a lot of examples up there, we're going to go through some of them in a second. Can I get any guesses from the crowd on what the number one reason why people shop using a mobile device? Anybody? Just shout it out. Pricing, availability, what else? Convenience, okay. Because they're bored. People are bored and looking to pass time. That's essentially what a mobile device does. It actually it fills time, it fills a gap. Where you once had to go back to your computer to shop back at home or back at the work, you can do it now. And we're seeing a lot of these reasons for driving mobile shopping. A lot of similar reasons, if you sort of strip out some of them and, and try and find some trends, it's what's happening is we we'll call it impulse shopping, call it whatever. The phone, now that it's on you, has a robust technology with a connection to the internet. It connects that inspiration to an action. So again, put this in real life. I'm sitting down, I'm waiting at the dentist's office, I'm looking at a magazine, I see a watch I want to buy, I can buy it at that moment. Whether you're on the web, in the store, seeing something in a magazine, again, the device allows that opportunity. It taps into that latent demand that you couldn't tap into before. The other, other reasons, if you start again, you pull out some of the trends, the phone, because it's access to information anytime, anywhere, gives you information to inform your decisions. It, it powers remote research. Again, I want to check product reviews to see before I make this decision, is this, what are people saying about it? 
if I want to get technical specifications, see how many gigs the processor is, etc. Check out the newest and latest products before I make the decision. It, it informs my decision and makes my decisions um, better, more intelligent. So let's talk about sort of the must-dos. Um, if now, now that we, we've seen that, that the demand is huge, mobile commerce is growing, and there are certain behaviors that are driving this, there's certain table stakes that you need to consider if you're building a mobile site or app. And number one is reducing friction. You've got this latent demand, and um, the great thing about this is that we've seen is that it's not just a shift from e-commerce to mobile commerce. If you go back to this slide, Again, we're, we're filling gaps. This is incremental. So it's, again, it's a huge opportunity. So as a retailer, as a developer, building a retailer shopping experience on a mobile device, it's most important that you have to do it right. And reducing friction, particularly in a small device, is paramount. So look at the differences between buy.com and the regular web experience on an, on an iPhone versus the actual mobile web solution. Look at the differences. You've got about, I don't know, 100 different calls to actions on the left-hand side versus about 10 or less on the, on the right. Draws the, draws the user in, can actually follow them into the experience much more seamlessly. So that's table six, that's very important. And the same goes with payments. So if you've got someone into, into the door, into your store, you don't want to put hurdles up when they're about to actually make the purchase. So imagine, I go back, you're back in the dentist's office, you're reading the magazine, you want to make that purchase with a watch, so one scenario is I take out my wallet, I pull out my credit card, I type in up to 12 different fields of information, including much of my private information and my shipping address and et cetera, or check out with PayPal and be tap, tap, you're done. So the point is, is that there are different ways. Again, if you're going to create a mobile shopping experience, reducing friction and improving conversion is very important. We've done some case studies and some tests with partners in, in Asia Pacific. We have a couple partners that um, basically offer this M Commerce in a Box solution. And that they've seen by mobilizing the shopping experience, they can decrease bounce rates from 70% to 20%. So, what that means, again, if you think about a real life store, imagine that your, your people come to your store and seven out of those 10 people walk in the door and walk right back out. By mobilizing the site, what you're getting to do is rather than seven people walking in, walking right back out, eight people are staying. Only two are walking out. And so if they get to act to the checkout, you have to make sure you've got a seamless experience and experience in which users can trust. We've done some A-B testing, a, testing with a retailer called Crutchfield, an electronics retailer, and they found by comparing regular checkout solutions to, pay, to PayPal, you're increasing conversion by 34%. So again, the idea is that there's certain things you need to do if you want to mobilize your, your shopping experience. Focusing on increasing conversion with a mobilized site or app and a good payment um, flow is paramount. So those are some of the things that they must do. Here's some, some things that other merchants and retailers, uh, maybe more advanced, on the more advanced end of the scale, are trying that you'd want to consider. Again, if we think back about the two different buckets, inspiration, connecting inspiration to action, some things that are out there, of course, you know, a good search experience that brings relevant results, ideally local results, because it can use UPS, and PJ will talk about that in a second. And also capitalizing on that latent demand, that sort of that impulse shopping using deals, daily deals, and then take it one step further by using push notifications, emails, et cetera, to tap into that demand. So, if I am anywhere with my device, I can not only, you know, if I want to, find the daily deals, but find the deals that are around me and they're relevant to me by clicking on an, um, a push notification. The others are sort of product scanning. Um, we talked about remote re uh, research. I'm in the store and I want to find out more information about that product before I buy. Again, reducing conver uh, improving conversion, reducing friction, why not be able to scan the code and be able to get information immediately to your phone? What's happening as a result with the mobile technologies is that we're seeing a convergence between, um, this actually should say, uh, remote behavior and retail behavior. And mobile technology is driving this. Basically, the lines are blurring. 
So things that you were doing um, on your computer at home, you're doing now in the retail and the shopping experience in real life, and the way that you used to do things in the store is changing because you can actually use mobile device and technologies to be able to change that. We'll talk about a couple examples of this. One is augmented reality. Augmented reality is essentially you are doing exactly what we just talked about. You're converging the lines between what you did in real life and what you're doing with a phone with your optical technology. And one example is if I, I used to only think about buying sunglasses or shoes, for example, at the store. These are accessories. It's important to see how it looks, how it feels. The eBay app has an augmented, augmented reality solution. For instance, with sunglasses, you can see how it looks on me before I make the purchase. Don't have to go to the store. The other one is, you know, uh, actually, again, simulating that real world experience by looking around using your optical technology, your camera, and seeing what's around you in real time overlaid. And, and then essentially porting that web page into the world in front of you. I think there's a lot to be um, said around this. Um, rather than me talking some more, we'll talk about another example. Uh, PayPal partnered with a pizza chain, um, with, I think the most popular pizza chain in the UK, Pizza Express. And we helped them build a solution to really blur those lines. Um, so what people used to think about a eating and shopping experience at a restaurant has completely changed. So we'll go to video. The key features on the new Pizza Express iPhone app allow customers to do the following. Find a book a table, view the menu, log into My Pizza Express, and pay via PayPal on your iPhone. You can search your favorite pizza by selecting the menu option and finding information on everything you need. And if you want to book a table, you can select this option and Pizza Express will find your nearest restaurant, get directions, and have your reservation booked. Nice and easy. And using the My Pizza Express feature, you can save and track your receipts, bookings, favorite restaurants, whilst enabling you to take advantage of any vouchers and coupons at the touch of a button. By using the iPhone app to pay for your meal, you can take the stress out of some sticky situations. I mean, imagine if you're an important businesswoman with only an hour to spare and needs to rush back to the office on an important deadline. Or on a date when sometimes you just don't want to be disturbed. So we've all got one of those mates who forgets their wallet. Well now you can just pass them your phone and they can pay with PayPal. All you have to do is click on the app, select the pay your bill option, and enter the 12 digit code which will be clearly marked on the bottom of your bill. Once the bill appears, you can check the amount on the app, matches your bill, and add a tip if you wish. You'll also have the option to redeem against a valid offer code or voucher, and your total bill amount will be automatically amended. Then you can check out via PayPal. Okay, so um, it's again a good example. Um, I don't know, actually, is it just me or does that seem like the long lost British sister of Kate Hudson? Um, but not as good of an actress. Um, okay, so um, the cool thing about this, this, this solution, this partnership, was that when we talked to Pizza Express, we first talked to them about, okay, what is, what is the problem that you're trying to solve with this mobile solution? And what they described was that they have a rush, they have 80%, I think, or something, a huge majority of their sales happen during lunch hour. But they can't get people in and out fast enough to be able to accommodate that demand. Again, going back to that theme of being able to reduce friction. So we thought about, okay, how do you build an app that be able to reduce that friction and increase that turnover and have a good user experience? So just like she said, rather than going on a phone and reserving a table, you can do it while you're walking out of work. Rather than wait for the waiter to actually make the order, you can do it on your phone. And rather than wait for the waiter or the waitress to come to you at the table, you can pay with PayPal on your app. So um, I think that might be it for my slides. And PJ is going to talk a little bit about tickling the imagination on what could be next. Thanks, Martin. So Martin shared with you some of the table stakes um, that are required to just get a mobile commerce solution out the door. And some of uh, the ways people are pushing the envelope a little bit to push that experience further. But what we're seeing in those examples is basically taking the e-commerce experience and mobilizing it. This is great. You can't bring your computer with you everywhere, and now you can have an e-commerce experience on the go. 
But what are the attributes of a mobile phone that can create thrilling user experiences that aren't even possible in the e-commerce experience with a full screen and a full keyboard? When you look at the mobile technology that we're using today in most mobile com uh, commerce experiences, you're talking about mobile websites and browsers or downloadable apps. These are the core enabling technology of a mobile co commerce experience. What we're missing is context. So you're basically taking the paradigm of e-commerce where you're logging on from some IP address, some remote computer, detached from the shopping experience and facilitating a, a transaction. What we can do now with proximity technologies is wrap that experience in the context of the consumer. What is the consumer doing? What does he want to interact with? Where is he? What is he in the process of doing? Uh, what is his intent? Um, if you understand the context of the consumer, you can reduce friction uh, and therefore increase uh, these impulse buys that Martin talked about. So what, what is a pro uh, proximity technology? Um, I actually cast a wide net in, under this topic. I think it's a pretty broad term. Um, GPS is probably the most common one, but when I think about proximity technology, I look at the underlying technology in the phone. What is the hardware in the phone? And let's enumerate those different systems and figure out which of those systems can tell me something about the user's context. It doesn't have to be just the GPS that tells me where the consumer is. There's a lot more we can do there. So you've got the, the GPS system, great and powerful tool, a lot of people taking advantage of that. Uh, you've got the accelerometer. Uh, Bump is an example of taking advantage of that in, non, uh, in a way for which the hardware was not intended. You've got optical interfaces, the camera and the, and the screen. You've got a number of RF, radio frequency uh, protocols. And then you have an audio system built into every phone. So let's step through this and talk about different ways that these systems can be used to give you context about the consumer. So we touched on GPS. I'm not going to go into depth here. There are so whole separate conferences about location-based services. Um, but you know, think about taking this to the next level. So don't just think about GPS as location-aware ads. Um, think about ways that you can understand the context of the consumer, understand the intent of the consumer, and push them relevant information. So when I'm walking down the street, I might not want my phone to wake up and push me an ad, but I may want it to tell me that I've got a voucher or I've got a store credit from a return for a store that I'm walking past that's about to expire. That's something that's going to change my shopping behavior, and it's not going to do it in an intrusive manner. It's going to do it in a value-added manner. Uh, the accelerometer, again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, we, part, PayPal has been partnering with Bump for quite a while. It's just an example of creative uh, engineers using the tools that are available to them in, in unintended ways. Um, they basically uh, use the accelerometer coupled with the GPS, coupled with statistical algorithms, algorithms in the cloud to come up with a way to understand consumers' intent. Um, so basically using that technology without any device-to-device -device communication they can understand when two consumers are tapping their phones together with the intent to exchange contact cards or make a payment and so forth. Optical interfaces. Every smartphone now, and many of the feature phones, have a camera and a, and a multicolor, uh, bright, large, multicolor screen. These are incredible uh, input-output devices for, for data communication. Uh, Martin talked about product research. This is one of the biggest uh, trends we're seeing happening in mobile commerce today. Consumers want more information before they buy. They want the ability to do all the research they do in, on e-commerce when they're physically in the store. Um, when, you, when we talk about reducing friction in that example, product search is great, but if I can just scan the barcode, um, that just removes an extra step. It helps, it, it helps the phone to understand the, the intent of what I'm trying to do. And then the flip side, Using optical systems in the reverse way, I can actually transmit data. Um, I can use the screen to pr project a barcode, a, a QR code, um, any other optical image to transmit that data. So the, the best examples we see in day-to-day -day lives are you know, the Starbucks card, where you're actually using it for payment and loyalty, um, and then boarding passes in the airport to actually get through security and get through the gate. Audio systems. I, this is one of my favorite ones because it's just so creative uh, and ubiquitous. So the killer app for the smartphone was the voice phone call. Therefore, every single mobile phone has an audio system, and it was intended just for voice calls. But how do we take that ubiquity and leverage it for something more powerful? 
Um, so uh, there's a number of companies out today using ultrasonic sound waves to transmit data. Uh, Shopkick is one example. They put a beacon at the front door of major retailers uh, that emits an ultrasonic sound, and when you walk into that retailer, you can launch your Shopkick app, it hears that sound beacon, and it checks you in, it gives you updates, it uh, informs the retailer of who's there, it's a much more reliable check-in than just a GPS-based check-in, um, and it gives retailers the confidence that you actually did come into the store, and they can therefore pay more for that uh, information in the form of uh, kick bucks or points or loyalty and those things. Um, uh, a company called Narate is out uh, today, and they're demoing outside, um, using ultrasonic data exchange at the point of sale to transmit uh, loyalty information. So no longer uh, need to carry your plastic cards, you digitize your cards, and you communicate them to the, uh, to the clerk uh, via ultrasonic uh, signal. And uh, one of the examples that I get really excited about with this technology uh, is around couch shopping. So when we look at these mobile trends in this research, um, a lot of what's happening is people are using their mobile devices, phones or tablets, sitting on the couch with their laptop 10 feet away from them. But the, the convenience of sitting back, uh, watching TV and browsing things in the phone is just too much uh, to overcome, and so they do the shopping experience on the phone or on the tablet. Um, and when you think about this context, and you think about, frankly, the laziness involved in this mode, uh, the friction of watching a commercial and then going to take action and typing in the URL or, t or doing a product search can actually prevent an impulse buy. Uh, but what if you use the, the hardware that's in the phones today and the hardware that's in the televisions today and actually transmit an ultrasonic signal through the speakers of your television that can be picked up by the phone? Uh, now, when you launch your phone during the commercial break of that TV show, the widget on the home page of your phone pops up the ad that corresponds to the ad on the TV. So one click and you're at the web mobile website of that retailer. Just, just an example of uh, very creative ways to, to use the existing hardware. And finally, radio frequency technologies. Um, there are a number of different wireless protocols available today that are being under leveraged in the mobile shopping experience. Uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth being the most ubiquitous. Wi-Fi is, is today, when you ask people how they use Wi-Fi, it's really just connecting uh, to a local network for internet connectivity. And if you ask them how they use Bluetooth, it's really just connecting to their car's uh, audio system or to their wireless headset. These are incredibly powerful tools uh, that can be leveraged for uh, mobile marketing and mobile commerce. Um, so imagine you are uh, walking through a uh, movie cinema and you're trying to decide which movie to watch. They have all the posters, so you can, when you realize that the one you wanted to see was sold out, you can choose a different one. But imagine, uh, you can actually, imagine walking up to one of those posters and having it push you over Bluetooth a high-def streaming video trailer of that movie. And, and then at the end of the trailer, it gives you the ability to buy that ticket on the go. It's influencing your buying decision, taking advantage of the existing proximity technology uh, in the device, and shaping your buying behavior. Um, and this is an experience that we can unlock today uh, without waiting for 4G or 5G uh, network coverage in every building. Um, Wi-Fi is a, a similar example. And Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are great um, potentially because of their broad reach. You can be very far away from the transmitting device and still get a good connection. Uh, but they're inherently limited because of that reach. Um, I walk past Bluetooth devices and Wi-Fi devices all day, every day, and I have no intent to connect to them. That's where NFC comes in as a slightly different paradigm. So NFC is uh, a very short range. Uh, it stands for near field communication. It's a very short range communication protocol. Uh, instead of being within hundreds of feet, I have to be within an inch. Uh, this seems like a limiting factor. Um, I, have to, I have to walk up to the device. I have to touch my phone against it. And when I pull my phone away, I can no longer continue to stream video or anything like that. Um, but the positive aspect of this is that it demonstrates consumer intent. So while I might walk past the Bluetooth uh, signal without having any intention to connect, if I touch my phone against an NFC uh, device, be it a, a smart poster or another phone, it's pretty safe to assume that I am expressing intent to interact with that device, and I'm asking you, push me information, push me a shopping experience, push me uh, some uh, information to influence my buying behavior. Uh, of course, 
this is the one example of uh, the technology that's not out today, but depending on who you talk to, it could be uh, next year or it could be 2015, so uh, we'll see where that all goes. So what combinations of these proximity technologies and what use cases will you guys, the retailers and developers, put, to, put together um, to create the experiences of the future that will drive consumer behavior and drive incremental shopping? Um, just to take that movie example, um, you're in the cinema and you want to watch that, that uh, high-def streaming movie trailer. Well, you, want, you have to do that over Bluetooth. You don't want to be standing there holding your phone against the, the poster. Uh, but Bluetooth has this awkward pairing mechanism to, to express intent. What if you combine the different, uh, the different technologies? Just like uh, Bump combined the, accelerom and the accelerometer and the GPS, what if you combined NFC and Bluetooth? So what if you tap your phone against the poster, and instead of sending you a URL for a mobile website that talks about the movie, what if it sends you uh, a Bluetooth pairing instruction? And your phone automatically interprets that and makes a Bluetooth connection. And then you pull your phone away, you walk away, and you've got this persistent high baud rate uh, Bluetooth connection. You can stream the uh, movie trailer even as you walk away. You're combining the best of both worlds. You have very clear consumer intent, and you have long distance uh, uh, high broad, uh, broadband connection. So I leave it to you guys to figure out what use cases and what combinations of, of uh, technologies will empower your uh, mobile shopping experiences in the future. So uh, with that, hopefully we gave some of the novices to mobile shopping some of the table stakes to understand what are the must-dos to get your mobile solution off the ground. Uh, we gave you a, uh, so a few examples of people who are pushing the envelope and testing new things. And then hopefully we gave you a technology perspective on what tools are on the phone that you can take advantage of in creative ways. So we look forward to seeing all the uh, advanced mobile shopping experiences that you guys launch. And uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions. I think we have a wireless mic running around. I see one right up here in the right front. front. Right up here in the front. Hi, my name's Alex, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And I was curious about this, uh, the, the project that you had in the UK with the pizza place, with the, creating those codes that they had to enter for the, to pay for the PayPal when they entered the code in the phone, did you have to develop a complete POS system that would drive that web-based? Mm. So, yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's one that I can't answer, but I can follow up on that and we can do it offline in terms of well, actually, the actual integration. Yeah, I would imagine that probably what they had to do, but I was just curious about that situation. Yeah. At the, at the highest level, it, yeah. there was a third-party integrator that involved, and it took advantage of their existing uh, point-of-sale technology and their existing reservation uh, system and some of the open APIs that, that, that the existing vendor provided and just tapped into that infrastructure. So uh, it, there was some integration work, but it was not a, a lot of heavy lifting for them. Yeah, yeah I find this uh, very compelling, that whole situation there. It's pretty cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? One right next to you, Kerry, right behind you. Hey, guys. Um, I may have missed this. I walked in a little bit late. But how is X Conference fueling uh, the use of the features that are given to us on our smartphone devices? How is X, the X Conference right. innovate? Yeah, exactly. How do, how do you guys relate to this? And what type of um, you know, interaction are you guys partaking in to make this easier for developers and entrepreneurs? Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, this is the whole reason for the conference, InfraX.com, so which the availability of many d different developer kits, for instance, a Red Laser developer kit, as well as others that you have um, the mobile payments library um, on, on the web. So it's a, a lot of things that we provide are really sort of self-serve for developers, as well as sort of more um, partnerships that we can establish through integrations. Um, I think I would urge you to sort of check out all the different booths and representations we have from the Innovate team and the, and the ways you as a developer could actually use whether our open platforms and the developer kits to do that. A lot of the, just to add to that, a lot of the mobile commerce in a box functionality that we talked about will be exposed through the X.commerce uh, platform so that uh, you don't have to start from scratch redesigning things. You can take advantage of the infrastructure that we're building and focus your development time on the things that are unique about your application and not worry about the basic nuts and bolts of 
putting together a mobile shopping cart and mobile. Yeah, and I believe that um, M Commerce in a Box solution, um, which was one of the partners is on technology. I think it's actually maybe just renamed, is at, at the PayPal um, booth uh, today. Great, thank you. And over here. Thanks, guys. Uh, that was that was a good presentation. I enjoyed it. Regarding the in-store experience, particularly from a uh, mobile in-store experience, where do you see the infrastructure as it relates to large footprint stores, specifically relative to 4G, 3G versus Wi-Fi, um, and how does that affect the experience? You know, in terms of the the large the infrastructure issues, various degrees of Wi-Fi, as you know, that are implemented in various retail environments versus 3G, 4G. I just wanted to know what you guys thought of that. What, what where do you see that going? <clears throat> sure. Um, when you look at the Wi-Fi uh, infrastructure in a lot of these big box retailers today, it's, it's pretty limited and it's hit or miss. Um, mostly what you'll see is sort of internet cafe type stuff that won't cover the entire store. Uh, and some of these big box retailers won't have cellular data coverage, period. It's you know just the giant concrete metal building just blocks it. Um, what we're seeing now is a lot of smaller companies come out and putting in their own Wi-Fi networks or Bluetooth connection networks for mobile marketing purposes. So this is not uh, Wi-Fi for the sake of making a high-speed um, internet connection for everybody. But you know that's coming too and you know, we'll, we'll see more of that. Uh, but, but the interesting thing is putting in a, a Wi-Fi network specifically tailored to um, support a Wi-Fi enabled end cap marketing experience. So at the end of an aisle, there might be a, a marketing display for a set of products, and there might be a Wi-Fi uh, access point there just designed to push you marketing materials there. So um, a more limited use case, but what, what you get a as a result is that you don't have to deal with all the firewall issues associated with putting a Wi-Fi uh, access point into a large big box retailer. So that's coming. They're getting more comfortable with open uh, internet connections, uh, but the near-term solution is if you want to do it a RF-powered marketing experience, just put in a dedicated network just for that, and you bypass all the firewall headaches. Issue obviously with the retailers as well, right? Yeah, it's the uh, you know there's this trade-off right with information is if you give open access to information, you're trading off um, giving consumers the information they need to be comfortable making a buy uh, a buying decision in your store. You also open that to um, open up information you don't necessarily want the consumer to see. So a lot of what the, the X.com pl platform is trying to do is uh, build tools for retailers to leverage the positive information and not be scared of potential you know, negative information that comes in. Yeah, the good news is, is you know, we've seen numbers as high as 30 percent just on 3G or 4G usage in the store by the consumer. So right. it's, it's happening. Yeah, and we're, we're encouraging retailers not to have a defensive position of, if I don't give them internet access, they can't possibly find a better price. Uh, that's not a long-term strategy, right? So we're encouraging them, put the internet access in and leverage it in a way that you, such an overwhelmingly positive buying experience, you delight the consumer and they just, they, they can't help but buy it immediately. And the, a lot of our uh, cross-channel initiatives are supporting that as well. So um, we're building the ability, the platforms, uh, to allow you to be shopping in store, make a purchase on your mobile, and have it shipped to home if you just don't feel like uh, carrying the, the item home, for example. Um, so enabling cross-channel, multi-channel retailing in a seamless way um, is a great example of uh, delivering a great user experience that leverages the technology and, and doesn't fight against it. Other questions? There's one, one over, over here, here? Or, or if we have one on the tablet. Hi, guys. Um, I got a question about conversion. So my understanding, web conversion is um, on a shopping cart is in the low single digits. So on mobile, are we seeing it higher because of intent? And then also, if you could recap the conversion numbers you talked about with, was it Crutchfield, sort of the retailer, the before and after? It was an improvement versus I didn't get the first part. Was it just? Yeah. So there are two parts to that question. The first is, I think, how is a conversion working for mobile? Is it, um, is it just inertia, or is it actually conversion once they get to the, to the site? I think if I'm catching that correctly, it's a little bit of both, right? So what we're seeing is that mobile shopping is incremental. 
It's filling a gap. Essentially, the device is there. Um, you'll be able to connect inspiration with action. So we're seeing that actually mobile shopping is incremental to what we're already seeing with e-commerce. And it's growing faster than e-commerce did as a, as a percentage of retail sales. Now, in terms of actually the conversion, um, it's, so the point was essentially you have to take advantage of that incremental demand and in actions by having a, a mobile optimized site or niche solution or app to be able to, to draw them in and make sure they're converted. So the two examples, and we can actually you know, go back to those um, that we talked about were, give me a second here, we'll scroll right back up. So the first one is M-Commerce in a Box solution. The one we just mentioned before is a company called On Technology. I, I apologize. I think they may have just renamed or demoing something today. But using a channel partner that we have to be able to mobilize. Actually, this one is, is one in which they can actually do both, both um, give you an e-commerce site as well as a, as a mobile site. And what they saw is that um, the conversion rates where if you already had a website and you viewed it through your smartphone, it wasn't optimized for the mobile device that the, the conversion improved, or the bounce rate improved from 70% to, to 20%. So in other words, I have discovered the site somehow, maybe through um, Google search or something like that, and in the former case, three, only three out of 10 people stay and actually browse, navigate, maybe purchase. And the second, um, eight, out of, eight out of 10 people stay. Now the point, at, at that point, is not only to get them to stay, but actually to get them to convert, to truly convert. Convert as in um, to make a purchase. And so this is where the other example comes in with Crutchfield. And your, your, your question was about how did that work? And so we did A-B testing with just a normal sort of uh, credit card checkout solution and also with PayPal. And so PayPal can host both, both you know, credit card as well as your own PayPal account. And we saw that if you compare the two, the two side by side, that the, the actual conversion rate, actually finishing the purchase once you express intent to buy is increased by 34%. There's an interesting thing about that because um, a lot of people when they build websites, they build mobile solutions, they often think about the actual checkout solution last. It's just sort of like you know, linear thinking. You think about, okay, what's the, the site all about? What's my value proposition? How do I get people there? How do I market? And then it's almost an afterthought, how do I get them actually final, through the final checkout? If you put these numbers into practice, I mean, this is essentially the same thing as um, if, you, if your monetization model is based purely on e-commerce, it's the same thing as increasing your traffic by 34%. So if you have a mobile site, and this you get a million visits per month, and you, want, and you want to actually buy traffic at 25 cent CPCs, that's going to cost you over a million dollars to get that type of improvement versus a two-week integration or less to get you the same. That, that was super helpful. The the one uh, question I had is, is again, just on a macro level, comparing shopping cart abandonment on web, which is low single digits, right? What, what do we think it is overall on mobile? Because look, I've only got one screen open on my mobile phone. Like I can be multitasking like a, <laughs> like a banshee, right, when I'm on the web. Got I am going, I've got a document open, but when I'm on mobile, I've got that, if I'm buying something, again, like you said, inspiration and intent. Yeah. Do, do we have some general figures on that? Um, I do not. I know that there are lots of... I, I don't have that. We can yeah. get that for you. We, yeah. we have the guys that track that. I would actually yeah. suspect that it's lower, uh, despite the multitasking example. Just the friction involved uh, in that last bit of give me my shipping, give you, put in your shipping address and the credit card number and all that information with a tiny little keyboard. You know, it's, uh, and, and keep in mind that these are... Uh, incremental impulse buys. These, it's not like I'm saying I have to buy this. Um, I'm either going to do it on my computer or I'm going to do it on my phone. This is, if I'm in the moment, I kind of feel like buying this. If it becomes too much of a pain in the butt, I'm just not going to do it. So you got to make that you give them, they're looking for, almost looking for excuses to, to curtail their spending and you just want to remove those friction points. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And we have time for a couple more questions. Anything through Twitter? No, tw no tweets. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. We, well, thank you, everyone. We'll leave you oh, with that. We, oh, sorry. You still want to ask a question? We'll follow up. We'll follow up. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll follow up offline. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate thank you. it.